So um, thank you all very much for coming. I'm going to step aside because there are a lot of people reading tonight, and you're not here to listen to me. But I did at least want to ask you to open up this beautiful uh, collection of poems and stories and photographs to the inside front cover, please. Um, because I just want to thank all the people that helped put this magazine together each semester. And if you look on the inside uh, first page, I guess, behind the title page, you have me as the editor, but then <clears throat> all my associate editors are here. Uh, well, Sonia is not. Sonia Fernandez, who helps uh, with the photographs, is not. But Rachel Heinhorst, Chris Kais, John Kulikowski, and David Phelan. If y'all could just stand up just for a second uh, to be recognized. And guys, thanks. I, I, yeah, that's for you guys, too. Because um, every semester we do solicit uh, work from the community, and it comes in, and it comes in, and comes in, and so I have other eyes helping me. It's not just, I don't, I'm not the only one that does it, and I just want to thank all the, all the editors, uh, and then Brenda also for putting it together. So yeah, um, this is the last reading of the spring semester, and it's a good one because it's, it's, it features the work, the works of students and faculty and staff, and then people from the CSM community, the three counties that we serve. And again, it's, I'm grateful to be given the chance each semester to provide a place to publish the poems and the stories and the photographs from people from the community of Southern Maryland. It's, it's truly a pleasure. And I, and, I, and I see every time in December and in May with the amount of people that come out, it's, it's, a, it's a testament not only to um, the work of people in this community, but the idea that it's, it's, it's featured each semester here. So thank you all for coming. I'm going to step aside, and I'm just going to let each writer come up or presenter come up and give as much or as little background to the piece they're about to read uh, as they like. Okay, so we good? I'm going to get out of the way. Uh, Christian, you're up first. Basically, what I'm about to read is called The Destructiveness of Fear, and it's a part of this series I'm working on called The Destructiveness, where I basically break down the destructiveness of one thing that I'm talking about. So that's about it. So, okay, here it is. <clears throat> I heard tears fall from her eyes, I felt the walls tremble as the usual thumps erupted from the bedroom, the obnoxious screams, the brute moans, the helpless quakes, the disruptive music intended to overbear the vituperative, the vituperative dialogue. I covered my ears, glued my eyes shut, forced my head into my pillow, but the noise wouldn't cease. It echoed clamorously through my tiny skull, evoking dread and despair. I smelled blood gush from her nose. The halls released the tinge of iron, almost as if the floors were covered with pennies. The short bursts of retaliation she had were dismantled by a more dominant force something I was afraid I would become, partly because of the subjection to this behavior, and secondly, the man who did this was my father, someone I admired at a time in my life, a person I shared interests and characteristics with, none of which mattered as I heard my mother get pummeled countless times. I was a boy, no older than 12. The noise would always frighten me to a halt, paralyzing my willingness to interfere, but tonight was different. Tonight I saw my dad for what he truly was, by the time of my realization, Mom had almost given in to his antics. Luckily, I hadn't. My 62-inch frame tiptoed seemingly to the kitchen. Creeping past the closed door, my father had been ferociously beating Mom. I knew where he hid his weapon, on the bottom shelf inside a white plastic cleaning bucket. The 22 Magnum felt cold and rigid in my palm. The design was so, was so old and the color was deteriorating. A blackish-gray mark scurried across the side of the Magnum. The grip was firm and weighty, blanketing my entire hand. I inched back up the stairs closely to the ground until I arrived to the door. The music still stern and overpowering, my lips quivered, and my hands were sweating from the touch of the gun. I was crippled by the overwhelming burden of knowing what I planned on doing once the door opened. Yet I still encroached. The music was more obnoxious when the door flung open. My eyes scrambled and finally focused on what I had been hearing for months. 
Dad paused. The sweat from his forehead froze as did my finger, which was planted firmly on the trigger. I should have shot him, but I hesitated. It was either the trepidation or I wanted simply an explanation. Mom began to cry. I held the gun above my chest. Dad said, put the gun down before somebody gets hurt. I refused. Words wouldn't crawl out of me, so I began to cry. I couldn't shoot him. Mom was almost egging me on with her eye contact, but I did it. The music was still deafening, turning, tuning out any background noise. I turned quickly to the closing sound of creaking stairs and shuffle feet, gun still abroad, pointing straight. The officers, the officers saw me open fire. I died. Hello, everyone. How are you guys doing tonight? My name is Teddy, and um, my poem is called Leave Behind. It's on page 70 of the, the uh, Connections booklet. I kind of wrote this, I guess, just thinking about the things that I've done in the past, and I guess also thinking about my children as well, and um, kind of just reflecting on things and just what I want to leave behind, I guess, if you will. When all is past and all is forgotten, what have I done in life to leave behind a legacy? Everyday things hide accomplishments. You wake and you go to work. You get paid, you pay some bills. The loop of everyone's life, a recycling bin of people doing the same thing. To view my life now, do the things I've done have meaning or have they been empty days of wasted space draining my life? Punch a new time clock of goals to set and start doing them and be, and be remembered as the man who never gave up. Thank you. Uh, my work's on page 16 and uh, a really brief introduction. The quality of the poem I really, I really like, but the content was the least favorite out of the five I submitted. So um, after I graduated here, I went to work full time before I went to uh, pursue my bachelor's. And I, I woke up early in the morning and every day before I left, uh, my mom was just getting up and I got to give her a hug. And I came back and it was long and I got to hug my mom again and it was great. And it was, it was long days and I did that for about a year and a half. And then I went to Salisbury University and I was like, man, this is my mom, <laughs> you know? Um, so that's, that's more of the, that was the draw for the first stanza. And the second stanza is more of, well, there's people here and but it's it's just not it's just not the same. So that's I know it doesn't really sound like that, so that's my frame of reference here. A good hug is hard to find. The girl to give it to is just as hard. It's tight and taunt, like the roof of a blanket fort in the living room. It's clean and expected, like a ritual of affection, not a rite of infatuation. It's warm like hands in pockets, like my mom, like the sun off the water. It's saying love to you, but words are meaningless like currency to inflation. It's right now. This moment matters even when a part be near. It's the world's strongest men, how they pick up stones. Something to prove, the pain of completion, knowing all must end. Hands wrap round, careful, because to slip would be selfish. Starting from the fingers, the pull. My chest pulls in and back reacts to her front. Arms envelop, love note, folded, tucked in an envelope. I hold her, but at will she holds my will. Like carrying a load, it takes everything, then the release. Gratifying is picking up a heavy stone or barbell. Body pulses and warms, satisfying is affirmation. Reciprocated seething may be spiritual. Codifying a friendship, a goodbye, a welcome, you're welcome near me. Falsifying like this reality. You're new and do not know me, let alone love me. A good hug is hard to find. A girl to give it to is just as hard. Um, So my piece is on page seven. Um, so the story behind this piece was basically I was a senior in high school at Tulane High School in their visual arts program. Um, 
there were a lot of things going on which you can expect for your senior year in high school. A lot of people go through the stress, the anxiety, and all of it. Um, there were a lot of things that I wanted to tell people since it was my last year there. And I felt like if I told them I would have lost friendships or I would probably never hear from them again. I basically made this piece because it was a lot of things I never said. I didn't tell my teachers how I really felt. Um, I didn't tell any of my friends how I really felt. I was just going through a lot of stress and I just didn't know how to put them into words. So I started writing things down and it helped a lot. It helped me relax and focus on my schoolwork again. I started to figure out what I wanted to do and I really like writing all of it down instead of telling people and then making them upset or losing friendships. And when I did the piece, I basically just balled them up because that was just me not telling anyone. And I put them inside the mouth and I started letting them fall out because eventually they were going to come out, but not at the right time. And that was basically the story behind that piece. Page 20, page 20, page 20. <laughs> I'm glad to be back. I've uh, been here before in this same uh, position with uh, the poetry that I, uh, I love to write. I'm a United States uh, Navy veteran. Are there any veterans in the room? Any veterans? Please stand. Please stand. Please stand. Please stand. Please stand. Give our veterans a hand. I'm the uh, co-founder of the Veterans Organization here at the College of Southern Maryland. So if you don't know, my name is Bill Buffington. All right. Uh, I've always wanted to do this. I've always wanted to pull my poem out of a silk. <laughs> I've always wanted to do it. Seriously. I hope you're recording. You got this one? <laughs> Everybody know me, it, me as a character around here on the campus, but uh, I write serious stuff. I, uh, when I came up with this, this piece, I was actually sitting on my deck at my house in the backyard in the fall. And I saw a leaf take a shape off the tree as it fell to the ground. If people change colors like the leaves in the fall, it's the name of this piece. If people change colors like the leaves in the fall, would the world still be so black and white? Would it see me as a person or would it still see me as a person of color? <coughs> would it enslave the evergreen because it never changes color? Would some colors still be considered better, better than others? Would you continue to stereotype because of shapes or sizes would there be a sign reading orange on this side, yellow over there, and purple not allowed at all? Would it be fair to say prejudice and racism might still exist? Would it be fair to keep saying that as long as we keep seeing color, we will not see the true beauty of each other at all. Even if people could change colors like the leaves in the fall. Hello, my name is Kathleen Jones. I'll be reading my story, Imagination on Fire, found on page eight. 
Establishing Your Connections booklet. The rain had just let up, and yet the sky was still as dark as night. The electric train whizzed through a seemingly empty train yard, slowing down as it advanced. A shadowy figure darted towards the train. The man's foot hit a puddle, soaking his Converse shoe and part of his right pants leg. As he dashed after the train, he tossed his bag into the cargo car, grabbed the handrail, and jumped into the car. He took a moment in the dark car to recline against the side and catch his breath. Safe. Eventually, he stood up and made his way towards the passenger section of the train. Maybe, if he was lucky, he could get something to eat. The dining car was lined on both sides with booths, where people sat eating and looking out the holographic windows at the scenery of their choice. He sat down at the back booth, pulled up the holographic menu, and ordered a computer-generated perfect meal that he didn't intend to pay for. He took a moment to look out the window and turned off the holograph. He preferred reality. The electric train was passing through what once was the countryside, but the city was slowly taking it over. Soon, there'd be no more empty fields. All of a sudden, a haggard-looking man in a large trench coat flopped down in the seat across from him. Mind if I share the booth with you, mate? No, I suppose not. Please, go right ahead. Wonderful. Me name's Art. I'll be a witch hunter. Can't let those nasty buggers keep overrunning the world. Now can we? Been on my feet all day tracking. What be your name, mate? This man was very comfortable identifying himself and his job, something most people didn't openly display. He piqued his curiosity. Roderick, sir. I'm just a traveler. May I ask why you feel the need to hunt those with magic? Well, it's my job now, you see. Also, magical folk aren't needed anymore, and they damage the young ones' minds. How so? Those people that has magic make young ones think things they ought not be thinking. I've been hunting them magic uses since the law was created 30 years ago. Word in the city be that they're finally the only one left. I hope to be the one that finds him. Joy taking out that last user would be sweet. You mean to tell me, sir, that you have been killing magic users for over 30 years? Roderick was shocked. He knew the hunters were out there and had intimate knowledge of how they'd operate. But he never met anyone who'd been hunting since the beginning of the law. Trained me kids, too. Mind if I change the window? This month-long rain is starting to depress me. Roderick shook his head and motioned with a wave of his hand to the window. The hunter continued talking about his hunting exploits, while he changed the window to a forest scenery with animals hidden among the branches. Now you don't see any more, much more of those. Roderick was concerned how comfortable the stranger was with sharing all this information. The hunter appeared to have no qualms conversing with the stranger and telling all his life stories. Art knew the gentleman sitting across from him. This was Art's target, and he couldn't wait to take him out. Finally, he read of all the magic users once and for all. The pay increase wouldn't be so bad either. Roderick's food finally arrived, and he devoured it like the starving man he was. Art finally fell silent as he watched Roderick eat. If he had his way, this would be Ardrick's, Roderick's last meal. Art had all his plans in place. He had predicted everything this man might do. After all, he even dreamed about this day for a while. Electric chain started slowing down, signaling a station pass through. The lights in the cabin suddenly shut off, and the passengers in the dining car started panicking. Roger leapt to his feet and ran towards the back of the train. Someone was beyond him. He had to get off this train. Roger made it back to the cargo car, took a quick glance at the surrounding areas outside, and jumped. He rode across the ground and back up to his feet, and took off running at full speed. The train continued on its course away from him as Roger ran towards a line of abandoned buildings near the station. Footsteps, footsteps pounded the ground behind him. Who was that? Was someone on the train chasing him? Was it Art? Could he be onto him? Roger didn't have the time to think about it. He had to get away and hide somewhere. Roger noticed a door slightly open up ahead. He aimed for it. Once there, he quickly ducked inside. He shut the door and leaned his head against it. With a single thought, he made his hand glow and turned it into a flashlight. A high-pitched gas sounded behind him. A scrambling sound followed, echoing around, and a bag was placed over his head. Hey, what's going on? He hollered out. Be quiet, magic user. A deep voice scolded at him as hands shoved and pulled him forward. Somewhere along the way, Roger lost his bag. The hands spun him around a couple times before forcing him into a chair. A different pair of strong hands held his own and prevented him from moving. With a snick, he heard the electric locks find his hands. Though he could not feel them, he knew that if he tried to pull his hands apart, electricity would shoot through his body, 
enough to knock him out. Electricity stopped his magic. He was effectively trapped. What are we going to do now? A female's voice asked. I don't know. I didn't expect him to be one of them. A different male's voice answered. His voice wasn't quite as deep as the other man's. Did you see his hand glow? It was amazing. Mister, can you do any other magic? Oh, please let him do more magic, Jesse. A high-pitched female voice practically squealed. Please be quiet and let us handle this, the lower-pitched male told her. So far, Roger distinguished four different voices, and the way they were echoing around, he guessed he was in a small warehouse. If it wasn't for the electricity and the bindings, Roger could probably have escaped. Can someone please tell me what you want with me? Roger asked as the electricity and handcuffs turned off his hand. His pants were beginning to get uncomfortable and chafing slightly. Jesse, can't I shoot him? The first man asked. No, you need to control yourself. We need to hand him over to the authorities. Oh, please, let's not. Can't we let him go? The second female voice pleaded with the other. Or better yet, can we keep him? Why don't we give him a chance to speak for himself? A fifth voice joined the conversation. His voice was also male and sounded older than the other two, deep and scratchy. Silence filled the room when he finished speaking. Sure, why not? But we won't remove the bag. The man Roderick had been able to identify as Jesse told them. Roderick sighed. It was a chance to convince them that, about his side of the story. This was a chance that Roderick had only dreamed of having. Please, you have to let me go. Someone is chasing me and does want me to reach my goal. They don't want me to speak. Of course someone is chasing you. You are illegal. We should let them catch you. The world needs people like you to be gone. The first man shouted at him. Please be quiet. I decided to let him talk, and I will be the one to question him. Having footsteps echoed through the warehouse as one of the men walked to another section of the room. Now I'm guessing the guy chasing you is not a big problem for you. So, what is it they don't want you to say? Why should we let you go instead of handing you over to be taken out? Because I, I have something you are lacking. Something the whole world is lacking. What I have can't be taught, bought, or created through technology. It has to be fostered and nurtured. It needs to be coaxed into being and allowed to expand on its own. What is it? The elder femur asked. Imagination, he replied. Why do you think that imagination is so important? We've gotten along just fine without it. Imagination is the key to life. Without it, humans are no better than the machines you surround yourself with. I have imagination. I can see the world in ways no one can today. That is the real magic, Roger said. Out of the bags, his eyes were watering. Would someone shut him up? The man who continually voted for his death shouted. As he continued to speak, his voice got closer, signaling he's walking back over. He's blathering on about that nonsense. Imagination is the true magic. What utter rubbish. It's a useless tool, a ploy to corrupt the minds of the young. The world has gotten by just fine without it for the past 30 years. The great technology has made it so people like you have become obsolete. Roger leaned forward in his seat. He may not be able to see his accusers. This might be his last chance to make a difference to tell them that what nobody else was willing to. Don't you see? This is not a good thing. Technology is overrunning the world. The human race is not careful. All forms of creativity and freedom will be extinguished. You claim I'm obsolete, but it's the whole of the human race that is becoming obsolete. The sound of snickers filled the room. What do you mean? This time, the voice of the older female spoke, interrupting anything else he was going to say. Roger laughed back in his chair and turned in the direction of the voice. Take a moment to consider your life. When you walk into a room in your house, the temperature regulates itself. Everything from your clothes to your food is chosen for you by a computer. They even tell you how you're supposed to feel about things from politics down to the computer-generated books, movies, and music. Technology does it all. There's no room for independent thought and new ideas. What is independent thought, and how do you work it? The high-pitched female voice asked. Roger gasped. He was floored by the idea that she had never, she was under the impression that it was some form of technology you needed to operate. The young ones aren't even being encouraged to think or being taught their own history. Technology is helping us. We no longer have to worry about human error or our own ignorance, the opinionated man argued back. A rattling sound interrupted Roger's reply before it started. We need to make a decision fast, Jesse said. Multiple voices sounded to the right of Roderick's position. He could hear Art's voice among them. It was Art who found him out on the electric train. Please, you have to let me go. Think of how different the world would be if they heard what I had to say. 
Roger gave one last plea. I don't know, Jesse. What he's saying is starting to make sense. Maybe we should let him go. I'm not in total agreement with what he's saying, and I lack my technology too much to give it up. But there are people in the world who need to hear this. The deeper voice being most sad as the sound of heels clicking on the floor came up behind him. Someone let out a sigh, and the bag was pulled off his head. Roger blinked suddenly in the light. Undo the cuffs. How do we get out of here? The man in front of him said. As the cuffs were being clicked off, the man came running over. You're letting him go! Ugh, fine. The gentleman who greeted him said, Boss, we got a problem. Hunters are here, and they don't look happy. Let's hand over the magic user and get out of here. This was the first man who Roger could come into contact with. No, we're in this now, Jesse said. All right, you guys are serious about this. I think I can get us out of here. Roderick stood and walked towards Jesse. I need everybody to hold hands. What? You sure I can't shoot him? The stubborn man protested while the young female immediately grabbed Roderick's hand. Just do it. We're going to be all, all in. We need to try trusting him. Jesse linked his hand with the young female. Soon the five of them stood in a circle. One of the men was still off to the side. You stubborn fool, get over here, the oldest man said. The other man let out a growl but obeyed. All right, I want each of you to close your eyes and picture a time in your life when you were safe and happy. It needs to be the happiest memory you can think of. Think back to your childhood when you were safe at home with your parents. Roger closed his eyes. Around the circle, the six men and women closed their eyes. Mentally, each of them were back at the age of innocence and peace. And safety washed over the group as they stood there. A shimmering veil slept and swept down, blocking them from the door the hard pincers were trying to break down. The young girl opened her eyes and gasped. Roderick also opened his eyes with a smile on his face. That should protect us. Protection veil takes your memories of safety and reflects that security like a shield. Come on, looks like there's a door back here. Roderick broke the circle, ran towards the back of the warehouse, and into the alley. The sound of wood splintering as the door finally gave in sounded behind him as they raced down the alley. One of them inspired a fire escape ladder, and six of them climbed up the top of the building. With any luck, Roderick said, panting from the climb, they'll think we're still running around down there. Now what? The young female recovered her breath and stared at the horizon. The rain stopped for the first time in months, and as the sun began to peek out of the clouds, Roderick looked down at her upturned face, the hope for the future. Now, we try to save the world. Um, I've been thinking, the baby Al, um, he was taken in Cambridge, Maryland, at a strawberry festival. They had different activities and tables set up, and I happened to come across one um, that was talking about preserving about the, their local parks, and they had um, animals with them, and one being the little baby Al, and he was just sitting there um, on this little wooden stump in front of the table, and I just hadn't had my camera with me. And that's one thing I've always had. I've always had my camera with me. I have my camera tonight, so I'm a photographer for the college. Um, I helped the main photographer to do different events like this, and I just can't believe, um, with talking to her recently, I've photographed for the college for about eight years now. Uh, I've been at the college about ten. I'm also a uh, permanent part-time in the mailroom. And, but he, um, he was just sitting there, and I was just waiting for the shot for him to turn his head. And I just got a couple shots of him there. And we also had, like I said, the other animals there, but he caught um, most of my attention. And I also have a, um, another photograph on page 64, um, my in-flight. He was taken uh, in Waterford, Maryland at one of the um, lakes there in St. Charles. My mom is a, a pet sitter, and I kept going with her uh, as she would walk around and have my camera. And every time I would see this heron, he would be too far away to, to capture, or he, or he uh, would fly away, or be in different spots. It felt like he knew that I was photographing him. So one time, I was just sitting there. Mom thought I was going to fall into the water. But I, I was all ready, and he uh, started flying again. And I happened to get him. I said, I got him. But when I got home, I, I didn't notice that I caught his reflection. He was just the tip of his wings, just brushing across the, the water. Um, but overall, um, I'm amazed that some of you may know this, um, but the other ones that, that don't know about me, um, I was born with a rare form of cataract, so I can only fully see out of one eye. And uh, photography in general is giving me another way.
the chance to see and to be able to, to share my work with you guys. Thank you. Hi, my name's Sean Rada, and uh, my poem is on page 62 of the booklet. It's, uh, it's entitled Conversation with a Tree, and it's sort of the direct result of a lifelong love through nature and an assignment from my world literature professor, uh, Rachel Heinhorst. I just kind of went outside and sat down and looked at this really, really gorgeous tree that's here on campus right outside of the library, and I just kind of started writing. Hello, my new yet old friend. How is the new spring wind treating your weathered bark? Do you miss the snow clinging desperately to your limbs, or the rains of autumn quenching the thirst of your leaves? Would you mind if I asked you some questions? No, I didn't think you would. Do you remember what it was to be a young sapling growing your roots? Were you ever stepped on? Did it hurt? Was it a man or a woman that took it upon themselves to assault such a beautiful child of Mother Nature? Ah, a man, of course. Too busy with the toils of everyday life to watch his footfalls and take but a moment to savor the beginnings of such an impressive tree. Oh, forgive me, I forgot to mention. You are a very impressive tree. Your luminous figure sits before me, and I am sat between two beautiful girls, yet I can't seem to take my eyes off or away from your moss-covered trunk for even a moment. Tell me a story please. You must have so many. Surely you can spare but one. Tell me of the most beautiful day you have ever witnessed. What season was it in? Do you want to go back or do you revel at the sight of new sunrises? Who am I? Excuse me, I, uh, I forgot that trivial detail. I am not but a mere observer. Hi. I'm Olivia, and I wrote Transistory. It's on page 65. A hauntingly dark sky gazed upon the thick forest below. Those woods had once been noble, once grand. The brilliant green grasses and joyous fauna had once aided in giving the land its heavenly mystique. For this place that had soothed the soul, fostered bonds, and given birth to mirthful memories was no longer. <coughs> it had fallen. <coughs> the world gripped in the hooked talons of the one who now claimed it. This new master had turned the rivers viscous and red with blood, the soil brittle and incapable of giving life, and the trees whose branches once twisted toward the sky in, in the direction of whimsical wonder for anyone who dared desire adventure now hung low reaching the ground like desperate broken limbs, begging for help, clinging onto anything living that may pass. The ruler, the owner, the beast, stepped through the sorrowful woodland in silence. Its equine nose and long serpentine tongue scented the air, looking for traces of fear, sweat, and tears. The signs of prey. In the distance, a twig snapped. The beast's ears twitched and slowly moved in the direction of the sound. The muffled noises became clearer as it focused. The dead grass and deceased leaves crunched underfoot as the low hum of dust swirling in the wind filled the night. There were other noises, hushed and urgent. Is it still after us? We have to keep moving. Voices. The prey was communicating, discussing their options and encouraging each other. They believed they had a chance, that the hunter was unaware. But they were strong, but they were wrong, so very wrong. It caused a feeling of dark satisfaction to burrow within the beast's chest. It knew exactly where they were, and it couldn't wait for the pleasurable high that would come from seeing their faces go from shock to horror to resignation, and then the nothingness of death. To the beast, there was something beautiful in the futile last moments of another. There was no need for more delay. It was time to feast. Rising on its haunches, the beast stared into a section of the forest and watched as the world appeared to twist and melt, oozing and collapsing onto itself. They were on the opposite end of the forest, but it would take only moments to warp the world and bring them closer. The beast was in complete control. It always had been. In silence, the beast took several lazy steps forward, moving through the rift it had created before sitting beneath the trees as its quarry approached. They would meet face on. Its prey was human, two males, one with dark skin and short black hair, the other with flesh whiter than bone and blonde hair that stood straight, reminding the creature of fangs. The former had always been clever, observant, and cynical. It was of little surprise he was one of the last. 
the latter was clumsy, loud, jocular, and in the beast's eyes, stupid. He should have been devoured ages ago. The beast could not help the amusement if it felt that these two complete opposites would have to work together. They had never been close, and a part of the creature dared to feel a little disappointed that they would not provide it with some humor. Perhaps the blonde would crack a joke before his neck snapped. Stay close, we don't know. There it was. The transition. Surprise, terror, but not resignation. Not yet. In the dark-skinned man's eyes, there was fire behind that fear, for in his hands was the beast's treasure, a rusted scythe with a crooked, ancient snap. The beast was perplexed, and sure of how one of its favorite things ended up in the possession of such a feeble creature. Are you scared, monster? The man asked in a booming voice as his comrade padded up beside him. You should be, because tonight we get our revenge. He charged, aiming for the beast's belly, but with just a flick of its wrist, the beast ripped through its opponent, sending him flying into a tree and a torrent of blood raining down onto the land. The crimson liquid immediately vanished, getting absorbed into the vampiric ground. No! The spike-haired man cried as he ran over to his convulsing friend's side. The beast went to collect its weapon as it heard the dying man utter a pain-filled run to it, his companion. It was too late. The beast had already wrapped its long tail around the ankle of its next target, and it hoisted him into the air. Ignoring the screams of panic and pleas for release, the beast unhurriedly approached the bleeding man. Now came the resignation, the defeat. The inferno in his eyes had dimmed to an ember, and the beast couldn't have been more pleased. Gripping the scythe, the beast swung, and the man's head fled from his neck. Hunger moved the creature's legs now as it neared the body. It moved its mouth near the fallen, opened its jaws, and paused. Ravenous though it might have been, the beast did not want flesh. It wanted something better, something much more exquisite, the very essence of every living being, souls. With a long, slow intake of breath, the beast began absorbing the bright white cloud that emerged from the deceased. With the souls came knowledge, and as its muscles tightened and strength grew, the beast could recount every event from each of the souls' previous seventeen lives. Soon the body was gone. There was no blood, no wind in the ground from where the man was slain, nothing, as though he had never existed. What did you do? What did you do to him? There was still one more. Bringing the tail that was long enough to rival a tree's trunk close, the beast stared deeply into the eyes of the flailing human. Did we mean nothing to you? How could you do this to us? We were your friends. Was it only some sick game? We could have helped you get out of here, you... One bite was enough to silence him. The beast slowly consumed the soul, but no matter how much it ate, the ever-occurring feeling of emptiness returned, gnawing at the space food should have filled. Hi, my name is Sherby Carson, and I wrote Rosebud on page six. And um, I've been to a lot of funerals the past couple years, um, a lot of a couple friends and students and relatives, um, and even though those they're sad events to attend. It's it's really a beautiful thing sometimes too to sit in a room like this, kind of of strangers, but to hear the stories about somebody that you loved and kind of allow them to continue living experiences that you didn't know of and um, kind of relive their humor in a way. And um, when my grandmother died, I was listening to everybody else's stories and. And I realized that I didn't really have one with her, and that kind of that kind of made me sad. Like I should feel sad, I should feel bad right now, and I really don't. And um, and it kind of made me realize that sometimes there is just a hole there where I didn't really know my grandmother very well. There was a lot of secrets that she kept, and um, and there was just kind of a hole in that space, and it wasn't an incomplete story. Um, but that absence of her presence in my life was part of the story. So, um, yeah, that's what this is kind of about. She never knew much of her mother, even less I knew of her, my grandmother. This leathered matriarch, introverted, within a deafened shell, feeble, bent. She kept her stories with her, ashamed of the label, the stigma, the tribal affiliation that yielded only pain. Her home, the Black Hills, twice stolen, once in occupation and twice in memory. 
Fear stripped the dialect of the earth from her lips, and her eyes only hold the language of the river. Vacant hole where others swell pride and heritage, a flag, a land, a people. Fortress of secrets, she took with her the keys to vaulted truths locked and lost forever. Census takers, requiring first and last name, stole the honor of Rosebud, a name earned, and gave us only Jones, devoid of meaning. She was not a Jones, nor am I. My blood, it surges with the rising voices of a misnamed people, yearning for release. The unspoken song of the weeping forest, she stirs my soul beneath starlight. At fireside, I hear her, I see them, dancing, and I cannot leave their company. With every inch of hair, every tree ring of experience, her song grows louder within the carved amphitheater of my spirit. Good evening, I'm Kate Lastman, and my poem is on page 60. And I see this one as a celebration of early mornings and one of my favorite flowers. This is Morning Glory. The name of the Morning Glory glows like a sunrise when said. Its leaves flow over the trellis, a cascade of heart shapes eager to bask in early light. And whether in rain or wind or fog or sun, the celestial azure and white blooms unfurl, rejoice in a new day, simply because it is, and they are here to experience it. Thank you. Uh, my poem is on page 74. Um, you can go ahead and read it right now, because uh, there's some context that has to go behind it, I guess. Um, in the poem, I reference a thing called 100 Days, and at St. Mary's College, they have uh, 100 Days Before You Graduate, and you go to the local bar down there, uh, the Green Door, and uh, you basically just celebrate having 100 days left to, for graduation. Also, there's a reference to like uh, a band's album in here, and the, and the year is 1994, just in case anybody was wondering. And it's called, uh, nice, nice to see you again. I see you both walk through the door between college students waiting for a drink. The feelings are high, we're about to graduate. People are yelling, congratulations, and happy 100 days. I watch as you both pass silently through the crowd, and no one else can see you. I want to talk to you, tell people about you. They think I was going crazy. I'm standing at the bar with five close friends, ordering drinks while they're telling me about their classes. People are playing pool and shoving money into the jukebox. There's a Caps game on in the background. The, mi the night moves on like this. After you order a drink, you talk, then order another, and move through the crowd. Talk about classes, talk about our future. Time is standing still at this moment. I remember walking between mud huts with you both in country, and then I think about our bars, the beach hut and outrigger. How I had to carry Benny home one night after too many drinks, that seven mile walk back to the barracks. Don't think I forgot about you, Mike, those long and angry nights filled with sadness, throwing up in your truck, telling you to get fucked, laughing about it the next day. Standing here with people born the year Weezer's Blue album came out, with Green Day and Soundgarden on my mind, happy for once. Listening to the joyful shouts of young adults now, who never had to see a child missing a leg, or a man shot in the face. Never had to walk for miles in the heat without enough food to make it the days up mountains and through villages. Or wait in the dark for water while the gunshots and explosions were heard through the vast desert of time. Never having to think about a friend taking another human's life. I can see you with your drinks now, though. Happy to see your brother where he is. I spent a long time being angry about your deaths, but life is too long for that. The journey is almost over, boys. There's only a hundred days left until graduation and the end of another chapter. I can't wait to see you from the stage. I can't wait to see you from the stage. Hi. 
Hi, uh, my name is Emily and my poem is found on page 49 and it's called Times Have Changed. Um, just really brief background, this is actually written as an extra credit project for my world history or world literature class. Mm. Oh how the times have changed. I can't look at a book without judging it. The colors that cover, the size, and even the shape. Can't even begin to explain the reasoning behind these judgments. I'm a kind person. There's no Regina George backhanded compliments here. I accept those for who they are if they have the courage to show me. They say you need to be on the right side of history, but to be right or correct is determined by a majority. All of these ideas are drilled into our heads before we can even comprehend what is being said. Oh how the times have changed. We're not fitting into someone's norm causes us to feel dread. I see it all the time. Two girls in history class making fun of the girl across the room just because she doesn't fit in anyone's mold, her own person. If only we had more people like that. These two girls don't understand what it is to be your own person. I even heard about one of them getting mad because one day they didn't match outfits like they planned. Clap it up everyone, conformity at its finest. Oh how the times have changed. It's no longer countries going to war with each other. It's now groups wanting control of what they've been denied. A terrorist group that commits obscene acts of violence because demands weren't met, I stand with Paris. Plan a task communicated through the messenger feature on a PlayStation. What has technology done to us? Oh, how the times have changed. Technological advancements meant to connect us have brought us that much farther apart. It seems more interesting, more interesting to be bored staring at a phone all day than to be out and about in the amazing world we call home. Rumi the mystic poet spoke of imaginative freedom. He wrote for everyone, not a one exempt. Love kills us, but the lack of love eats away at us much faster. If this so speaks the truth, then are we our own destroyers? We are merely depriving ourselves of a basic need. You are supposed to advance us, not set us back. Way to go, technology. Oh, how the times have changed. We're becoming fat, dumb, and happy, making poor decisions and claiming YOLO, watching terrible things happen before our eyes, and either turning away or pulling out our phones instead of helping. What happened to giving the shirt off our backs? To make time to kick back and relax. Give me one good reason to not try to unplug humanity. Wait, you can't? Oh, how the times have changed. Try to tell me I'm beautiful. I won't believe you. Compliment my skirt. I'll think you deceiving. Say a thousand times you wish you had my body. I think you, I'll think you're crazy. Tall and skinny. Everyone's like, you should be a model. And I just laugh it off. Small breasts, slim waist, blemished skin, hairy arms, need I go on? Everyone's like, love yourself and your body. How's that possible if everyone targets people's insecurities? One look in the mirror, only imperfections are seen. The society I was born into constantly critiques. Every minuscule de detail of the body and makes those different feel like freaks. Since when are women thought of as objects? Hmm, let's see. Oh right, it's in most parts of history. Our importance came from our ability to bear children, but even then, the boys were the valued ones. Now the guy-girl actions are totally dealt with in double standards. Guys can go out with their friends no problem. Girls, it's I need every detail of the night before you might be able to go. Guys can wear shirts with half-naked women on them. Girls get reprimanded for showing bare shoulders or leg above the knee. Guys can get around and be praised for it. Girls emit a small amount of promiscuity and she's labeled a whore. Tell me, where's the disconnect? You wonder why sometimes I'm shy. Try hearing the whispers people say, making fun of that which I cannot change. Look at those glasses. Hasn't she heard of contacts? Why, yes, I have, and I've asked for them, but I didn't ask for lenses to be put on my face at six years old. Fast metabolism prevents me from gaining actual weight, so not much chance for building muscle. My face. Healing from a bad reaction to keratin this summer. Completely broke out. I dreaded leaving the house. Makeup made it seem worse. I felt so helpless. No one said anything when I was in public, but of course I saw their glances. Since when does it matter so much how I look to other people? Yeah, I have my insecurities. Name one person that doesn't. A new favorite quote of mine is it's none of my business what other people think of me. Imagine if more people thought like this. Women wouldn't second guess everything someone says to them. Women would have more freedoms, should have more freedoms, could have more freedoms, but society says no. Try to tell me society can change. And I won't believe you. Hello, everyone. My poem is Dreamland on page 52. Why is it hard? Why we just can? We're a group just like a band. Imagine as I say, 
even if it's hard. A world full of happiness, and no one says cut. Imagine a world where we can be free, where privilege isn't money or power, and just being me. Where you don't have to run from your face or who you are. We can all be happy, every second can be fun. Imagine there is no tangle, no one cares about your race, because we all see an angel. Where the answer to unity isn't the real place. Um, we, are, we aren't worried about war, hate is replaced by love. There is no bomber or shell, and what's a nuclear, nuclear weapon, what's a bomb, um, and there is no reason to fail. No kid would live behind their life on a landmine. No one sees any fault, just like we are all blind. Just imagine we all are free, forever free. We are painless. No one's heart is broken by a bar. So this, so this uh, stranding isn't the headline of the news. ISIS didn't kill anyone not just because they couldn't. Imagine everyone smiling because there is no reason to cry. Everyone has a right to be flying. Imagine we all can love. There is no broken heart. No one is starved because everyone is loved. Imagine there is no murder. Why would we kill each other? Um, where it is fiction and fable to be in jail, no, never. Just imagine if, if we, if it's a crime, even if your throat would be full of gold by saying it. Imagine a world where all the wars would be busy with says prior. There is no king in the world. People all can be equal. A grain would be divided between all the people. Imagine there is no border. The whole world can be home. We can say we are all human. There would be no rule or order. Just imagine you can be the interpretation for this dream. We can all move for an inch. Just imagine everyone's happy. Wow. One last round of applause for everyone. Very well done.